welcome. Oh, get this out of the way. All right, so you, I'm Jeff. You just heard a little about what I do. My first question for you guys is, who the hell are you, and what are you doing here? You guys, uh, how many of you are developers? Good. That's a good start. Excellent. How many of you uh, work in JavaScript primarily? Okay. Uh, how many of you have started playing around with web components or the Polymer project? Excellent. Okay. Cool. Uh, how many of you want to know more about web components in the Polymer project? Most of you. Excellent. So since there's only a few of you that are actively working in it, and there's a lot of you that want to learn more about it, I'm going to probably skim a little bit more along the surface. Feel free to, I'm around for the next couple hours. If, you, if I'm not going deep enough on anything for you, pull me aside. I'll be wandering around out here or over in the speaker lounge. Ask me any questions. Happy to have deeper conversations. I just don't want to you know, focus for the four of you that are already ready to go in deep and miss the rest of the crowd. So if I'm not going deep enough, please feel free. Pull me aside. Ask me questions. So what are web components? Well, really simply, it's the latest attempt to let, to let us write customizable, reusable components in things that would look like this. Right Here we have inside an HTML page, my super cool chart. And one thing that you'll notice about web components is the way the browser is able to tell it's a custom component and not something that's native to the browser is the hyphens in the name. So that's one of the requirements that we'll have with web components is whatever component you create, you've got to throw a hyphen in there. And so Polymer, what's Polymer? How many of you are familiar with Polymer? Excellent, more of you than I would have expected. It's a library that's built on top of web components, but also gives us polyfills and the ability to use the technologies needed for web components for the browsers that don't yet support it. And so ultimately, there's three main pieces to Polymer. It's a series of polyfills to make sure that all the browsers that, all the evergreen browsers for lack of a better term, are able to use the technology. Uh, it's got it's a web application framework that helps us to put things together, and it's a set of UI components. Are anyone using any of the Polymer components in their production applications today? No one. Oh, one person. Excellent. So today, we'll be talking about web components in Polymer, and specifically things like, what are these web components? Why are they here? Why the hell do I care about web components? I've already got enough stupid frameworks to deal with. Why do I need one more thing to deal with? How do they work? What do I do with them? Can I make my own? Can I actually use them? Will modern browsers support them? And what does it mean as I start to build applications? How do I use them? What's it mean? Is it, like, it going to make my life ultimately easier? Or is this just going to be one more technology that I have to learn that is going to be obsolete tomorrow and I'm going to wonder why the hell I wasted my time? So these are the questions we'll be talking about. So some things to bear in mind. We're dealing with sort of bleeding edge technology here. The reality is that there are no browsers today that are currently released that fully support any of the web component specifications. There are some that are close. But the reality is that it's not there entirely for the views. A uh, couple of the interesting things to note, however, is that with Polymer and the polyfills, we can actually get the full functionality in the vast majority of the modern browsers, which is great. So again, is it real? The web components by themselves, they're a real spec. There are parts of the spec that are implemented in all of the various browsers. But the components by themselves without Polymer to fill in the gaps is not entirely real today. It's not, work, it's not fully implemented. However, Polymer exists to fill those gaps so that we can use them in modern browsers. And so a quick chart, and this comes off of the Polymer Project website in their browser support page. What you'll see here on the top is where is Polymer supported. And you'll notice across all of the browsers, whether it's Chrome for Android, Chrome, Chrome Canary, Firefox, IEs, Safaris, or mobile Safari, everything is usable. Everything is either green or yellow, which tells us that we can work with this in all of these technologies through Polymer. On the bottom half of the chart shows where is the actual support, the native web component support without Polymer in browsers today. And you'll notice there's 
much more of the purple not supported than there is of the green supported. So a couple things to just bear in mind on this. And actually on all of the Chrome ones, you can see the numbers inside the green that tells you which version they became supported in. But even in the latest Chrome Canary, we still don't have all of the pieces. Actually, this, slide, this particular one is a couple weeks old now. The latest version, I was looking at it this morning, I should have copy and pasted it into here. Canary now has a few more green boxes than it did three weeks ago when I copied this in. So why should you care about web components in Polymer? Well, the reasons I care is as an application developer, I love the idea of encapsulation. I want to be able to write something once, have it in a nice encapsulated package, be able to reuse it, and not have to worry as I reuse it that it's going to harm other things in my application. I want to know that when I drop in my tag, it's going to just do what it's supposed to do and not interfere, not break other things, not have its styles trounce on other people's styles, not have its methods get in the way of other, people, other, other methods in the application. And again, as a developer for many, many years, I've come to expect this in most languages. And the sad reality of the web without prior to web components is you have to go out of your way normally to make things truly encapsulated. So we, thankfully, with web components, the encapsulation is much, much better. We have a much better degree of reuse. The complexity and implementation is, can be hidden away, so we only need to, deal, need to know what the API is for how we're going to interact with it. It deals with CSS scoping so that our, our styles inside the component don't affect the ones outside. And unless we specifically ask the ones outside to talk to the ones inside, there's a barrier, and it won't cross it unless, again, it's possible to, we can tell it from the outside, hey, I want you to reach in there and change the style. You do have that ability, but it will be a conscious choice and not something that just accidentally happens, which happens far too often with the various component frameworks for the web today. Uh, the other nice thing about web components in Polymer, we have nice ease of distribution, and we get to make appropriate technology choices, right? We get to make components that we can very easily reuse as tags, rather than having to have 50 lines of JavaScript to instantiate a new data grid or a new whatever it is we're creating. Does that make sense? So this is what I care about. This is why I like it. So ultimately, how does it work? The reality is there's a couple different specifications that come together to give us web components today. Shadow DOM is one of the important ones. And by the way, the links here are to the latest versions of the specifications. Currently, all three specifications are in editor's draft. They are subject to change, but they're moving along the process, and they're much more stable than they were just six months ago. Custom elements is another one of the specifications, and HTML imports is the third one. And we'll talk in more detail on all of these. So let's just take a quick peek first at a sample application I have. So this here is a little language application. And what you'll notice, let's just actually run the application for a second. Come on, there we go. So what we have is a simple application where we can fill in some information, choose some languages that we want to claim to speak. It would be boring if I just said English, so I'm going to choose a few others, and choose which one is our native language, and we can submit the application. And as we've submitted the application, we can come to the other page and see who has applied. And so the reality here is that we're looking at several different components put together into a single application. At the simplest, each of these cards for an applicant here, that's a component. The list of languages you see over on the right side and that we saw both here and here, those are all a single component an option group component that I wrote. And depending on parameters I pass to it or attributes I pass to it, it might be rendered as checkboxes, it might be rendered as radio buttons. And so it gives me nice reuse. The reality is the two different pages in this application, the enter application and review application, are in themselves components. So really what we have is we have an application that's made up of two core components. So my index HTML page, if I come over to here, my index HTML has two core components, my language application and review applicants. 
And each of those, the language application, is made up of internal to, to the rest of the HTML with it. You'll see inside here, this one has my option group component, which gives me a series of options and allows me to specify whether these are exclusive options or non-exclusive. By exclusive, I mean I want them rendered as radio buttons so I can only select one. Or non-exclusive, render them as checkboxes. Choose as many as you want. So here's the exclusive false version of it. And down below, the exclusive true, where you choose which, which is your native language, which one did you speak initially. And so what we're able to do here is to take different components and assemble them together into a coherent application, very much the way I would do for most other languages I've, te I've worked in. And this was always a pain point for me in the HTML and JavaScript world, is that we never had this level of clean encapsulation before. A couple of the other components that you don't see, some non-visual components in here, are some services. So where is my service? Uh, here, so my language service is here, which is using to read in a JSON file for all of the available languages I care, in, I care about. And for the applicants we saw before earlier in our review applicants, we also have a people service, which is reading in another JSON file about who else has previously applied. Right, so the idea is we just take the components we need, we bring them together, and we're able to communicate between the components in a clear and clean approach. We're able to use data binding, we're able to pass data in, we're able to listen for events coming back out. So one of the core ways that this works is each of these components has a template. And really what the template is, is it defines what do I want to see and when do I want to see it within a component. And now the interesting thing about this is that these templates, they don't exist on the active DOM, they exist in the shadow DOM. These are elements that are not rendered on the screen. They're able, we're able to talk to them, we're able to interact and prep them, but they don't get rendered until we tell them to render. And that it's very easily to become clonable, so we can make multiple copies if we want, or changeable if we want to tweak them as we're moving through. So here's a simple example of a template. Right? So this div here is now a template, and I can work with this throughout. Again, and until we drop it onto the active DOM, it just exists in the shadow DOM. It's parsed, but it's not active. It's not rendered. So really what the shadow DOM is, it's the whole idea, it's, it's the core of our ability to have this as an encapsulated piece, we're able to have full elements that just don't exist within the DOM. They don't need to, we don't need to worry about rendering them. We don't need to worry about them interacting accidentally with other elements. So really what it is, is it gives us the ability to, let's step over here, I think we've got a, let's take a look at a quick example. When you think of an iPod, well, it's an older iPod, but you think of an iPod and you interact with it like this. If this were your component, as a web developer, you use just the component. Here's my tag, here's my attributes, it's all good. Really what the browser sees is something more like this. It sees a whole pile of pieces that make up that component and it knows how to interact with them individually. You as a developer using the component, you really don't have to care what all those parts are. It just works. Make sense? And so really from a more technical perspective, over on the left in green, you'll see the active DOM, and you'll see off that top node, it's called a, a shadow host. It means that particular node knows about other elements that aren't yet rendered. And all those other elements are existing in the shadow DOM. And so over on the right, you can see there's a whole other tree that exists in the shadow DOM, and we can bring that in or remove it as we need to without having to worry about it. it so there's a boundary. And so as it's rendered, we only render what we want to render when we want to render it. So likewise, this boundary gives us a, a strict border where any of the styles inside that shadow tree, they don't leak out. They're just encapsulated. They only exist within that tree. Likewise, the styles from outside the tree won't leak in 
unless we use the very specific colon colon shadow directive in our CSS to tell it, I actually want this to operate inside the shadow DOM. Right, so again, the things that are outside stay out, the things that are inside stay in, unless we specifically go out of our way to ask them to interact. And so the third key part of web components are imports. And really the idea of an HTML import, it's a way of giving us a reference to other HTML files that we can work with. And so it's very simple, like you see down below, here's a, an import pointing at something called goodies.html. So if we take a look back at the application I was showing you, you'll notice right at the very top of, which file am I in? The review applicant's component, you'll see I'm importing several different HTML files. Right, I'm importing my two services, I'm importing my options group component, and I'm importing my applicant card component. And once I've imported it, that import effectively makes that code available to be used here. I can then interact and use people service or language service or applicant card as I need to. And so, as I mentioned earlier, as you saw on this, the, uh, the chart that shows what's supported where, while imports aren't fully supported on most browsers, they, the polyfills are doing a really good job for, this, for us with this today. So that's kind of nice. The Chrome browsers actually have pretty good implementation of the imports on their own now without the polyfills. Virtually everything else still requires polyfills. One more final note on imports. Imports are blocking. And what I mean by that is it won't render anything else on the page until it's done bringing the code in from that import. So if a typo in an import or referencing an invalid file, the page will not render. So just bear that in mind. So custom elements, ultimately, are these things that we can use. We pull all of these things together, and we're able to create for ourselves our own custom components, or there's a whole series of existing components that have already been published by the Polymer project that we can start to use. And so ultimately, each of our custom components becomes a DOM element that we can define our, by ourselves, we can interact with, we can make it do whatever it is we want. And they can have their own state, and they can have their own scriptable interface, and they can really provide for us whatever it is we need to do. And so as we're defining a custom element, again, if we were actually working in, in a, only in a browser that fully supported web components, the tag we'd use for defining our element would be just the element tag. Since we know that we need Polymer for the vast majority of browsers, we're using the Polymer element tag instead. But really, within our Polymer element, we're able to tell this, this class ex or this component extends some other component, or we can not have that extends. That's entirely optional. We can give it a name. As you see in this one here, it's called Fancy Button. And we can define any attributes that we want to use, that we want to be able to simply interact with. So on my option group component, if we switch back to that for a second, On my option group, you'll see I've got three different attributes specified here. And a thing to note, as you're specifying attributes, they are space delimited. So I have an attribute called exclusive.